In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together the elect from the four winds of the earth, from one end of the heaven to the other. Now, in this session of What Jesus Meant series, we're going to find out what Jesus meant. Hello everyone and welcome back to What Jesus Meant series. Uh, today I want to talk to you about a verse still from Matthew chapter 24 uh, where Jesus talked about his coming and uh, basically what he's going to do through his coming. Now uh, I know that we have covered in the past I believe seven or eight sessions um, a great portion of Matthew chapter 24. Uh, if you haven't watched them before please go ahead and uh, watch them. We have talked about the days of Lot, the coming of the Son of Man, the passing away of heaven and earth, and many more. Um, but today I want to specifically spend time on uh, basically Matthew chapter 24 in uh, verse 31, uh, where Jesus says, And he will send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, when we want to understand this verse, we have to pay attention to what are the terms that Jesus uses uh, in this verse. Uh, the two main thing that he uses is the word angels and then uh, trumpets. Once we understand these two, it would be really easy to understand what Jesus is saying. Now, before getting deep into what I want to talk to you about, uh, I need to remind um, basically um, everyone that um, to understand the Bible, we need to understand the message of the Bible. Uh, the one and only message of the Bible. And that message has been from the beginning, the transformation of man into the image of God. Now I understand many say that man is created in the image of God and that is true. but uh, what is true, um, basically objectively, doesn't necessarily uh, come to fruition, doesn't come to being a subjective experience of people. Now, what we need to have is an experiential um, fellowship with the truth that is already true about us. What, otherwise, what good it is to say we are the image of God and we have no resemblance, no uh, likeness, no uh, basically expression of who he is. And that is not the work of God to just say something about us and without uh, changing us or bringing us into that place. We have many verses like saying that we are seated in heavenly places, but is it really experience of every one of us? Of course not. Is it really 100% uh, our experience? Of course not. Uh, we are all growing into that understanding to basically I take what is ours to inherit what belongs to us, to be corrected by the Father in our thinking and move in the way that leads into life. So uh, the message of the Bible, if that is being the transformation into the image and glory of God, therefore anything that we read has to be in that direction. Now there is a veil of understanding over many, it, it has been over uh, all of us and it's being removed one by one, which is uh, the Bible is about uh, basically heaven and hell. Uh, and that is basically a veil that is being spread over the eyes of many and everybody who, uh, those who actually read the Bible through that veil still read these verses. And when Jesus talks about the angels and trumpets, they're thinking about literal trumpets and also angels are being perceived as uh, winged creatures, uh, extremely tall, uh, mighty, and all of that picture that we have. Yet, um, anything that is in God's creation is supposed to externally teach us what is true about our nature. For example, when we speak of uh, the uh, clouds, uh, that cloud, although it's a literal cloud in basically a sky or heavens, 
and it rains literal rain and it causes literal plants and trees to, to grow yet that is being used concerning mankind in the Bible for example in the book of Jude uh, Jude speaks of a group of people that they don't understand the mysteries of God as and that, that's why they don't actually give that revelation of the mystery as clouds without water so if that is being true we have to question everything that we have believed even about angels now I'm not saying there is nothing like the angels supernatural beings but we have to understand what they are and um, uh, or even beyond that uh, to take what we see in the outward realm and understand what is the truth about our nature now let me give you an example when a child is born uh, he's being fed by his parents but there would come a time that he doesn't need to be fed by his parents uh, why because he just can't do it himself now if we come to the Bible and, and I'm going to maybe explain some of these verses and read verses like what we have in Hebrews chapter 1 speaking of angels that they are ministers, um, spirit ministers, they are flames of fires and they are sent to uh, basically uh, help those who will inherit salvation. Uh, we have to understand that um, there would come a time that you don't need the help of any angel. You don't need anyone's help. Why? Because you yourself are now the full mature son of God and that is our destiny. That is our calling. So we come to a place that we are not being helped by the angels uh, but actually maybe we participate in that mystery. So before getting deeper into this list, once again, once, again, uh, once more, uh, look at what Jesus says and uh, then go through some other scriptures so here he says in verse 31 and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds uh, from one end of heaven to the other now the other thing that i need to mention in this verse is it is the whole purpose of these angels and their uh, the sound that comes from them is to gather together it's to bring them together it's to bring them to a place and he says they are called the elect so now we are getting to see a theme that there there are people that angels would be sent to them and when they hear the angels they are hearing the sound of those angels and when they hear that they would respond to it which means they hear and they believe it so and he says that causes them to be gathered together and he says that's from uh, basically the four winds so let me also explain this what does the wind do it scatters the wind is something that when it comes it scatters everything that is on its way now he says the, 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 uh, this specific revelation here concerning the angels is that they would do or they would gather together that which was scattered by the winds. Now we're going to see also some of the things about the wind. And he says that's from one end of uh, heaven to the other which means a complete work. Okay now let's stop here. So let's get into the word angels first. The word angel it's uh, actually a transliteration of a Greek word, which is, which is um, I believe the uh, pronunciation would be angelos. So our angel uh, word in English comes from angelos. Now the word angelos, uh, when you look at it, it simply means uh, a messenger or someone that has a message. Or better to say actually someone who has a word because even the word um, un anglos comes from the word logos and we know what logos is is the word uh, which we, we read about in um, John chapter 1 in the beginning was the word so an anglos or an angel is the one that has a specific word now that word uh, when it comes to coming from God 
it's um, it's always basically used uh, with a prefix before anglos, which is the, the word you, EU in Greek. And that means well. So when we have something coming from God, it's actually a well message or a well word, or we can say a good news. And actually that is the, again, the exact word that we have for the word gospel. So even the word gospel, comes from uh, angels. But the difference is, as I said, there is a prefix uh, of well beside, um, basically before the word angel. So a message that is well, it's called the gospel. Now, why I say this? Because the word angel is used even negatively. So the word angels are not always positive, but they are also negative. They have a negative uh, basically function as well but that's not when it comes to God now we're gonna see all those verses as well so now what I wanted to say is to bring your attention to this fact that the the angels of God they bring the gospel of God and that gospel is the word of God so that which was in the beginning which is all ma God's intention for mankind, all God's purpose, even Ephesians, Colossians, Romans call that the good pleasure of his will. They are the ones that bring that. That's why we have verses like Isaiah 40 that says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the glad tidings, the good news, the gospel um, to the poor. So angels of God are the ones that have to do with the gospel they bring the gospel now let's let me clearly show this how paul uses this about uh, basically himself if you look at galatians chapter uh, one uh, in verse six he says i marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of christ into a different gospel, which is not another, but uh, there are some who trouble you and you want and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that, uh, than what we have preached to you, let him be a curse. So what Paul is saying, he says, I came to you Galatians, I came with a message, with a word, and that was called the gospel. And he says that gospel was the gospel of grace. That's the good news of the grace of God. And he says, I brought that to you. You heard it. You were established. You believed it. You saw even later, he says in chapter three, you saw miracles. You saw the works of God. You saw the baptism of the spirit. You were functioning well in the spirit of God. And you were uh, b basically being free from that old way of living, from flesh, from performance, and you were set free from your religious mindsets. Now, he says, later he says that, but there is a yeast that has come uh, to you, and he's leavening again, um, basically you, uh, with that old leaven of religiosity, uh, the leaven of the Pharisees. Now he says, beforehand, in chapter one, he says, hey, if I, I say to you, if any angel from heaven comes to you but doesn't bring this gospel so what is he saying the angels uh, before that Paul says I preached it to you so when we say angels they have to be people like Paul not uh, some wind creatures uh, descending from heaven it's other people now later you see Peter was one of them he was someone that actually uh, came with a message and that message was because of the fear of man. He began to preach what the um, uh, religious Jews were preaching, that they said they are believers, but they were still sticking to the old. And they were the ones that they were bringing the Old Testament leaven into the New Testament dough uh, or the bread uh, that people were eating so that uh, that message, that uh, word that came from those people became a message that corrupted them once again so they uh, became the angels also but again not the good angels not the ones that are actually bringing the good news but they are bringing that old leaven now paul later he says look at chapter 
4 about himself uh, when he came to them that he said you you heard it you believed it what I preached to you look at what what he says in uh, chapter 4 verse 13 he says uh, you know that because of my physical infirmities I preached the gospel to you at the first and my trial which was in my flesh you did not despise or reject but you received me as an angel of God you received me as an angel of God now you and I may read this and uh, because of that old uh, way of thinking uh, maybe we don't see the importance of what Paul is saying and Paul is basically calling himself an angel of God what does that mean he brought the word to people he brought he preached the word of God he preached the good the well um, the good news to the people he says you received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus that's a different subject but he says uh, when, when I came to you what was important to you was not my outward fleshly look but you heard the word the voice that came out of my mouth you you paid attention to that breath uh, from within that was coming out and it was blowing like the sound of a trumpet from my lips and you heard it now you began to be gathered together that's what actually what Jesus said um, and he said this is to uh, this is to gather together the elect now I talked to you about basically um, the, the whole purpose of angels with the sound of trumpets uh, coming um, to gather together those who were scattered by the winds. But let me also show you what Paul says in Romans concerning this elect, the chosen, the called. Uh, so we can uh, even understand this uh, better. So in Romans chapter 8, uh, we read something about uh, in verse 33 uh, he says who shall bring a charge against God's elect it is God who justifies so first of all we see that the elect are people uh, so when Jesus said he, they, they will gather together the elect here he says but against elects there is charge charges are being come now what is a charge something that comes against you uh, to charge you with, with a fault and because of that you would pay the penalty of that basically crime or whatever that you have done now this we know chapter 8 uh, chapter 7 chapter 8 of uh, the book of Romans speaks of being free from the old and being made new as a son of God and speaks of the carnal mind and the spiritual mind the carnal mind that is actually death the spiritual mind that is life so when it speaks of bringing a charge against God's elect that speaks of that which comes from the old uh, against that which God has called holy which is you now let me show you a few verse before what he said about being called so uh, if we look at uh, verse 28 uh, sorry 29 it says for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover whom he predestined he also called and whom he called he also justified and whom he justified he also glorified okay so what do we have here he says God knew everyone before they were born before they they came in human flesh God knew everyone and his purpose uh, was before their birth their physical birth and because of that when someone comes into human flesh he says uh, in John chapter 1 he says he is the light to every man that comes to this world so he says the word that made flesh Jesus the Christ when he came to the world in him was life and that life is the light of every man that comes to this world so God before we were birthed in human flesh he knew us when we came to this world then he actually gave us the light so we could see and we could understand we could uh, basically know the truth and we could be free uh, from the corruption that is in the world from the the old way of thinking from the fleshly way of thinking and all 
of that. Now he says, in order for this to happen, first of all, we need to hear what God says. He says, that's why the messengers are important. That's why the angels are important. But um, above all these angels, there is a chief angel who is above every one of them, who from whom basically he, if the angel, let's say, if the angels have a message, the chief angel must have the message. Now, if the angels bring a word, then the chief uh, angel must bring the word. Now, the word chief messenger or the chief angel, uh, I first actually gave you the translation of the word uh, so that now when I speak to you about the literal um, transliteration from Greek once again, you understand what I'm saying. The word chief angel is the translation of the word archangel. So the word archangel means the chief of the messengers. Who is the chief of the messengers? The word, the word itself, the completion, the entirety of uh, basically uh, the truth is the archangel, the chief, um, basically the chief messenger. Why? Because he's not anymore just someone who brings a message to you. He himself is the message. He's the expression of the message. He's the expression of uh, basically uh, the word. He, he doesn't just preach to you with his uh, mouth, with his tongue, with his lips, uh, but, or with his words. He himself is the expression, is the manifestation of that word. Now, who is that? It's clear. We read that first about Jesus in John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And that glory was as the, only, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. So the Son is literally the chief um, angel, the chief messenger, or the archangel uh, of God. He's the one that his life is the message. His life uh, expresses what God says to mankind. So that's why it's very important for all of us to uh, put away every doctrine that we have that doesn't match with the life that was expressed through Jesus Christ. Uh, that anything that we say about God, that's why I started with this way, that we have believed something about heaven and hell as basically the message of the Bible, but yet the Bible speaks of being transformed into the image of the Son of God. So the whole purpose of uh, basically the coming of Jesus in, in the first place on earth was to become the expression of who we are. So when we look at him, we can, as in a mirror, see ourselves. And through that, because we see ourselves like that, that would um, little by little transform us into the same image. Just as um, basically in this world we have looked at people and we have become their imitators, or if you will, we have become their representative uh, just by basically being transformed into their image, whether they, they could be our teachers or uh, some celebrities or the politicians or some good moral peoples or some religious uh, teachers, any of that. Uh, likewise, now we can see the sun and through that sun we can be transformed. So Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus says there is a need of the gathering together of uh, basically uh, the elect, now we have to find that what actually the, um, the things that were said or the revelations that came after the Gospels, the four Gospels, reveal to us about this gathering together. This is actually now in the book of uh, Hebrews. Let me show you something about this in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 12. Uh, after basically 12 chapters of laying down some amazing truths about truly who we are and what is available to us. Finally, in verse uh, 22, he says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, listen to this, to innumerable 
uh, company of angels. The word is myriads of angels. It's a big number. It's like at that time, ten thousands. Uh, he says, you have come to myriads or innumerable company of angels. Who are the angels? They are the ones that have a message. Let's continue. He says, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Uh, the word again, general assembly is the word festal gathering. It's a place that uh, is used from the Old Testament concept uh, that when the people of God, the Jews, um, basically three times a year, they were supposed to gather together and keep the feast of the Lord. That was called their gathering together. They would come from every part of the country, even from other nations that they were scattered in. And they would come back to Jerusalem and they would keep the feast. Now he says, you have come to Jerusalem. Yet not the Jerusalem that is in the Middle East, earthly Jerusalem. He says, this is a spiritual uh, realm of understanding, uh, of basically knowledge of fellowshipping with that spirit that lives within you and every other uh, basically member of the body of Christ. But some are blinded to it, some are sleeping into it, uh, but yet some are awake and some are experiencing this. So he says that assembly, that gathering together uh, is basically that which uh, we were supposed to be as the elect of God gathering into in that place. And he says, it's also the church of the firstborn registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, and to the spirit of just men made perfect. Now, this is chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. But chapter 1 amazingly starts by actually many comparisons between uh, the sun and angels. Uh, if you have ever studied the book of uh, basically Hebrews chapter 1 is one of those chapters that is at, at the beginning it looks like very uh, disconnected uh, verse to verse the concepts that are being introduced yet those are the treasures of basically uh, the truth of the word of God. Now in chapter 1 verse 1 uh, it says in the past God spoke to our fathers through the prophets you already see uh, that the prophets, therefore, must have been a type of angels. And that's why in uh, verse uh, basically 13, uh, sorry, in verse 14, uh, 13 and 14, it says this, that he says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, uh, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Okay, just... Uh, 12 verse earlier he said in the past God speak to our fathers through the prophets but to us in this last days through the son concerning the son he says to the son he says sit at my right hand but to which of the angels did he ever say sit at my right hand so who are in the context the uh, angels it's clear he's comparing the son of God with the prophets from anyone who had ever a word from God. And as I said, there is a difference between a word and the word. The Son is the word of God. But prophets are a word of God. And that's why he says God uh, at various times, which should be actually translated as in many portions, and in many ways spoke to our fathers through the prophets. So he says the, the word of God was broken into pieces. A piece of that was given to Isaiah. A piece of that was given to Jeremiah. A piece of that was given to Samuel. A piece of that was given to, let's say, Hosea. A piece of that was given to Moses. A piece of that was given to um, Ezekiel. And the list goes on and on and on and on. But these are just many pieces, uh, many small words uh, of the word of God. Now, when Jesus came, he said, hey, anything that was ev ever written uh, in the scripture by the prophets was written about me. So the word is he himself. Now the message that comes, that's why the message that comes from the Son of God, that is uh, the only voice that is the voice of a trumpet that would cause anybody that was scattered to be gathered together to him.
Now that role is not given to any wing creatures in heavens because no, none of those are actually preaching the gospel to you. You never heard the gospel from a wing creature. You heard it from somebody like yourself. Either you were in a street and somebody came to you and he preached the gospel to you or either you were at church and somebody preached to you or maybe you had a family member that loved you and they talked to you about Jesus or maybe you had a dream or you it's one of those ways it's um, it's very rare that you would hear that some supernatural being coming and preaching the gospel to somebody and even um, that portion of the ones that are beyond the veil of flesh and we haven't uh, we have seen them at times, we have experienced their presence, we have uh, basically uh, called them angels. Uh, again, not that they don't exist, but you can begin to see many things that we have attributed to those kind of supernatural beings uh, or uh, of other type. They are not other types, they are just spirits of just man made perfect, manifested in the realm of flesh. So let's say when uh, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, who appeared to him? Moses and Elijah. But the, the Bible says Moses and Elijah. And we know Moses and Elijah were two men. But when you, if they had, had they appeared to any of us today, do you think we would have known they are Moses and Elijah? Absolutely not. We would have called them angels uh, just with the old understanding. In fact, if you study the Gospels, uh, before crucifixion, after crucifixion, and the book of Acts chapter 1, you will see there, is, um, there are two angels uh, in the day of resurrection, resurrection of Jesus being mentioned in the Bible, and then there are again two uh, that are uh, basically they stand uh, on earth with the disciples when Jesus is being received into a cloud. So these two and the two, which is basically in the day of ascension, and the two that are uh, basically uh, in the day of resurrection are, I believe, I've studied this, but I don't have time. We, I think we covered this in one of our lessons, uh, are the same two that appeared on Mount Transfiguration with Jesus, which is they are Moses and Elijah. Now, if, if you study basically the Gospels, you see that in uh, one gospel, it says two angels. In the other, or in the book of Acts, I don't exactly remember, it says two men. So two men, two angels. And this has been uh, basically used uh, here and there in the Bible that he, he talks about angel, and then later, the same person is being mentioned as a man. Even uh, in the book of Daniel, we look, if you look at uh, Gabriel and how... Um, Daniel calls Gabriel, he says, the man Gabriel. Isn't it amazing? Uh, the man Gabriel. Now, again, we, we take all the names without understanding the meaning of the name. And uh, we, we miss the mystery that is behind it. Because they, they were not supposed to be transliterated into our language. We should have known the meaning of this. That's why even today, when we say Jesus, not many people actually know what Jesus means. Or when we say Christ, not many know what Christ means. Uh, likewise, when we come and we say the archangel, I said the archangel simply means a chief messenger. But the New Testament speaks of the Ar Michael, the archangel. So what, what about the Michael? What about Michael? What does Michael represent? Because names are names, numbers, and colors are very important in the Bible. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, it's constantly all about names, how uh, the names of the generation of Adam are named, how the names of uh, people that descended from Babylon is named, how the names of the generation of Noah have been named, and then how the 12 uh, sons of Jacob are being named, names are being changed, names are being given. Uh, you come to the New Testament, same exact thing. Why? Because God is conveying a message again. So when we say Michael, the word Michael actually uh, means uh, who is like God. <laughs> so Mar the chief, 
the, the archangel Michael or Michael the archangel means a chief messenger, the chief um, angel of God, the chief messenger of God, who is, the question is, who is like God? Which means this M Michael himself is like God and he comes to bring others into the same likeness. That's why the voice that comes from the archangel is very important. Now, to simplify it, the archangel is Jesus, the Lord. He himself is the, the Michael. He is the one that, uh, in, uh, basically, he's the likeness of God, the image of God, the expression of his glory, the expression of his character, the expression of his person. Hebrews chapter 1, after saying, God in these last days now has spoken to us, he says, he uh, who being the brightness of his glory, he is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So what does that mean? It means in him, first of all, let's say in his earthly life, in him was the glory, but the flesh was covering the glory. But once in a while, he did something that showed what is in, inside of him. For example, he turned the water into wine. That showed what is inside of him. And the Bible says that by this, um, actually, um, he revealed his glory. Now, do you think people saw uh, basically radiance of light coming from his flesh? No. What he did showed what is, in, is inside, inside of him. So the glory that was inside of him, the flesh covered it. Likewise, today, the glory is inside of us because Christ is the glory of God and our flesh has covered it. But likewise, it's just like the sun, S-U-N, that is being covered by the cloud. And uh, once actually, you can see even in the most... Um, um, basically in a day that uh, you have the sunlight and everything, all of a sudden a cloud can come and just cover the sun. So what is that? That's the covering of the glory so that those who can be hurt by it won't. So when Jesus started actually talking about uh, in Matthew chapter uh, 24 concerning coming with the clouds, now we have to understand what he is saying if the cloud is for covering. So I wrote for, I read for you verse 31 of uh, Matthew chapter 24. Let me read the verse before to see this in the context. So here he says in verse 30, then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds, plural, of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, so who do you think therefore the clouds are? If there are multiple clouds, not anymore just one cloud of glory that, uh, for example, in the Old Testament we had um, that cloud uh, going with the children of Israel for 40 years, not one cloud. Now we have clouds uh, that he says he will come on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Who do you think the clouds are? The clouds are again those who cover the glory. So he says he himself will come. But how will he will come is actually through the clouds. So let me say if uh, Jude chapter 1, um, it's only one chapter, but uh, when Jude speaks of clouds uh, as being men, so what do you think Jesus is saying here? He's saying the same exact thing. He says, th this time the coming is not going to be through he himself. It's going to be through he coming through his body, which is you and me. Now, before that, of course, there is a need for us to experience that coming. Um, and we can all benefit from one another, which means the Christ in you can help me and the Christ in others can help me and the Christ in other members of the body can help me so I can benefit from all these such great cloud of witnesses that are witnessing to me what is truth. But at some point, I myself become the same 
and I realize the same glory that is inside of them is in me and my flesh is the covering of the glory. So I become the cloud and the glory within. I realize what is inside of me. People don't realize it, but the message that comes from my mouth will now express what is inside of me, inside of me but at some point even the glory within will shine through just as Jesus uh, showed us in Matthew chapter 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration. The glory that was within began to uh, emanate uh, from him that people saw him as just the radiant, radiance of light. So the, what was inside of him is, was no longer held by the flesh, but the glory broke through and showed itself. So when Jesus says uh, there would be actually the clouds of heaven, it's people the glory inside of them. So the Son of Man comes that way. Now he says after that, he says because of that, angels, messages would be sent forth and they would have uh, a sound of a trumpet. Now I've covered this before, but let me show you what actually Paul again teaches about um, trumpet. Look at chapter 14 of the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, verse 6, it says, but now brethren, if I come to you speaking uh, with tongues, uh, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by teaching? Even things, now he goes to metaphor, even things without life or without soul, uh, whether flute, harp, uh, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? So likewise, you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? Did you see it? He says, what comes out of your mouth? is the sounding of a trumpet. But if you are not actually giving a clear message, your trumpet is like something that is not tuned. And those who hear, they don't hear the uh, sound that is cle clear and they don't understand why this, what is this trumpet, which is you, is saying. And because of that, because of that they don't get prepared for what that message was uh, saying. So, what is in the context? He says, if I come to you by revelation, knowledge, uh, prophecy, uh, or teaching, then I will benefit you and I will be like a sound of a trumpet. Uh, I will be like an angel of the Lord. I'm blowing a trumpet. I'm sounding a trumpet. I'm giving you a revelation. I'm giving you a knowledge. I'm prophesying. I'm teaching. And you're benefiting from that. And that would cause you to come out of what ha you, you have been held by and you can be gathered together to the Lord that is inside of me. Now, I understand everybody has the Lord in themselves, but what Paul is saying is that you, in your mindset, you are covered by a veil that is keeping you uh, in, basically in that uh, darkness. Uh, but when you hear the message, you will come out of it. Now, again, um, Therefore, when we say he will send his angels, the word, again, I think I believe the word sent uh, either in Matthew or uh, in Mark or Luke, it's the word um, uh, apostello, which, come, which is again, uh, we have the word apostle coming from that as a tra um, transliteration. And the word simply means someone that is being sent forth. So he says when angels go, they go as apostles, as the ones that are being sent. So every one of us, uh, at, to some extent are a giver of the word of God or an angel of God. Now, I want to take you to the book of Revelation and I want to show you how these things are clearly mentioned in the book of Revelation, the book of unveiling of the glory that is inside of us. Your flesh is covering it, but uh, because of the unveiling that is happening in the book of Revelation, once we become uh, acquainted with that knowledge, once we 
uh, acknowledge that good thing that is inside of us. Once we recognize this treasure that we have in earthen vessels, our flesh, it's no longer our flesh our, being our limitation, but what is inside begins to even uh, transform our outward appearance. So let's go to the book of Revelation. Uh, for example, in verse 1, um, I quickly go through this. In verse 1, it says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that God sent, again, Apostolo, uh, through his angel. So we have the angel. And we go down to uh, verse 7, and he says, Behold, he is coming with clouds. Or the word is, he comes uh, with clouds. Again, with clouds. Uh, so we have a plural clouds. And he says, this time, his coming is not like uh, that coming that happened through the womb of a woman called Mary and he grew and people saw it in his own flesh. This time he's coming in many membered body of himself. It, he's coming with many clouds. He's coming with many coverings uh, that are upon him. He's in every one of them and every eye shall see him but in them. So here he says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye will see him, uh, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. This is the exact thing that verse 30 of chapter 24 of the book of Matthew uh, told us. So here we have this uh, clearly. Verse 1, he says, The revelation is given, is sent through an angel. So the, the, the whole unveiling of Jesus Christ inside of us, the whole unveiling of our new creation, the whole uh, unveiling of our new man, the whole unveiling of a man in Christ, uh, the whole unveiling of who we, ha uh, we have become, or rather to say we are, is through the voice of angels. Now, there is one angel called the Archangel Michael in chapter 24. But then there are many angels. If you look at actually um, the book of, uh, if you do a search on the word angels in New Testament, it's amazing that uh, the book that has the, the most number of um, uh, basically the word angels in it is the book of Revelation. I think it's above 75. Um, uh, that, that's the count of the number of times that the word angel is used because everything in the book of Revelation is done through angels. Uh, when you see the, the sounding of the trumpets, when you see the uh, pouring out the bowls of wrath, when you see someone showing to John uh, the, uh, the great harlot Babylon, all of this are true angels, uh, different angels. When you see Again, another angel showing to John what uh, Jerusalem is, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. You see an angel, a mighty angel descending from heaven, covered with cloud, and on his head a rainbow, again, an angel. Uh, and um, again, 70, over 70 times the word angel is being used. Now, um, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, of the book of Revelation. It's uh, basically two unique chapters in this book. And they give us, again, all this, if you look, study it, we've covered this before, everything is symbolic. They're not um, literal things that we are seeing. They're not uh, literal creatures. They're not literal lambs, literal dragons, literal uh, cities. They are symbolic representation of a truth uh, that God is uh, trying to actually convey to all of us. So, when we go to the book of Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, what we see in that scene, first of all, in chapter 4, it's the same exact thing that, that Jesus basically told us, coming with the cloud. You see actually from the cloud, um, thundering and uh, lightning is coming forth, and angels are around the throne. It's the same exact thing that Matthew chapter 24 said. But what I want you to see, is actually chapter 4 and chapter 5 are the vision of the truth about the accomplished work of God in mankind. Remember Philippians 2 says that at his name every uh, 
knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is actually shown to us in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, uh, which means it show, uh, what Philippians says that will happen, John sees as it has already happened. So he is having a vision out of, in the spirit, out of uh, basically the realm of the flesh, in the realm of the spirit, the vision of eternity and the accomplished work of Christ through the Lamb of God, uh, which has redeemed everyone. And this is what we read in chapter 5. He says in verse 11, uh, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. Again, the word is myriad. Remember uh, that we, we read that uh, we have come to Mount Zion, to New Jerusalem, to the city of the living God in Hebrews chapter 12, to innumerable company of angels or to myriads of angels. That is being actually told uh, or mentioned here when he says uh, the number of them was myriads of myriads. That means uncountable. And then he says they were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Uh, so sounds like Philippians chapter 2. Sounds like every knee is uh, bowing down, and every tongue is confessing that the Lamb of God, He is worthy. He who uh, basically did not consider it robbery, being in the form of God, did not consider it to be robbery, to be equal with God, but He actually came as a servant, he lived as a servant, he lived obedient, even unto death, even to the point of death, to the Father. And therefore God raised him up and gave him a name that had the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. So here it says, everyone is singing this song, worthy is the Lamb, and he is to receive power, glory, all of that. And in verse 13, listen what it says, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every creature in heaven, on earth and under the earth. And such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and forever. Do you see anyone excluded in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, everyone. So what is this? This is the vision of the completion of the work that Jesus Christ the Lord has done. So John is having a vision because uh, Jesus says in the beginning of chapter 4, he says, come up here because I need to show you a vision of how I see things because if you don't see it, uh, and if you don't see in this place the throne of God, that how this throne operates or has operated and what it has done, you will not be sent forth as angel with a message so powerful that can set people free so they can subjectively experience what is at the end of chapter 5, which is them worshiping God because they are being redeemed, because they are now finally they are being set free from sin, death, corruption, from uh, basically carnality and every one of those things. So uh, after that, beginning of chapter 6 now, John begins to see, okay, so this is how the transformation works. Uh, people are books sealed and their life actually which is inside the Christ is not, has not yet appeared. The seals need to be broken so the life can be manifested and people can see them and read them as an open book. And he says, this is the beginning of the process, um, which is the breaking of the seals. And right after that, it goes to trumpets, to, the, to bowls, uh, to the point that finally at chapter 20 shows us uh, there is no more anything called Hades, death, um, devil or whatever that has been binding people under that uh, old nature, old mindset. Uh, carnality that they had and they can experience all things new. So that's basically in a nutshell what the book of Revelation is all about. It starts by God sending his angel and he says uh, his coming will be with clouds which means they will declare uh, who he is, they will be the manifestation of him 
on earth and then he shows a vision of eternity in the heaven he says look what you see this is the truth about me not what you have believed not you have been taught not you have preached even uh, and that's why even you see uh, John marveling a couple of times he he sees these things as as if he didn't know and that's true because uh, well they were also surrounded by um, some other religious things and they were being uh, under the oppression of Jews and you see that in basically the epistles so the point being the angels are um, in the context of what we have been reading so far when it comes to uh, basically every individual let's say me myself uh, it speaks of actually the spirits of God himself uh, or the spirit of God himself be the angel to me that's one uh, that's when basically I'm paying attention to the glory that is within me uh, that's how Jesus lived by the way he was always moved by the spirit of the father that was inside of him that was his angel but um, I'm also uh, because I'm being surrounded by other people they are no different than me and they have the spirit of God inside of them and they can be also a an angel to me that's why Hebrews chapter 13 I believe verse 1 after um, saying that we have come to innumerable company of angels chapter 13 I think verse 1 says so don't uh, forget to entertain strangers because by doing so some um, without knowing they have entertained entertained angels which means they have heard a word that is from God not a word of man not a word of bondage not a word of religious performance a word pure as fire from the Lord himself because again the last verse of chapter 12 says for our God is a consuming fire so the the, the work of the angels is a multi um, uh, facet or multi face uh, work of God that is being expressed through them uh, for people so they can experience the truth uh, for themselves and they can be free from that and they can experience the transformation little by little that's what it means that he will send his angels so it's not speaking of a last day kind of <laughs> belief system that uh, there would be angels coming and they would literally take one uh, each angel grab the hand of one and rapture them into the heaven and the rest would be burned that's uh, ridiculous that's uh, the doctrine of man and it has nothing to do with what is being expressed in the Bible now uh, I want to mention that the word aim because uh, we, we just talked about angels you can just study the book of Matthew look at the parables at how Jesus spoke concerning the angels he talked about the time of harvest also and the harvest is the harvesting of that which is being sown in you uh, and he said that will be true angels again which means uh, basically and again let me just explain that parable Paul says in chapter uh, 3 of the book of 1st Corinthians he says um, you Corinthians you still say I'm of Paul I'm, a, I'm of Apollos I'm of Cephas and he says because you are still bringing this division into the body of Christ you are being carnal and you don't understand there is only one body and then he says but who are we we are co-laborers with God you are God's field and we are his uh, basically workers so, so if he says you are God's field that means in you there is something is being planted and he says we are God's co-workers that means we are the ones that plant the seed now Jesus talked about the seed of uh, basically the good seed the bad seed he talked about the wheat and tares and he said the good seeds are that which the son of man plants but again how does he plant through other angels through other people Paul says I'm the one actually who planted and Apollos watered but God brings the, the increase so what is the time of harvest harvesting that which is being planted in you the word that you heard uh, that now it comes to fruition which eventually is the seed the Christ this is the fullness of it the seed the Christ becomes a full mature tree inside of you so um, when we speak of basically angels it's as I said it's a multi-dimensional work of God 
inside of mankind. It's true a message, it's good news, but the bad one, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us, he says, again, I don't want to go into details, but in the context of saying, um, uh, Paul says, I have betrothed you to one husband, the Christ, and he says, uh, but uh, it sounds like you are being deceived, uh, like Eve was deceived by the serpent, uh, from the singleness that is in Christ. He says, uh, but if anyone comes and preaches to you another gospel, so you already again see, if somebody is preaching the gospel, but it's called another gospel, that means it's not the gospel, that means it's not the good news. And I said, the ones that actually preach the gospel, if you look at the word, they're angels. So he says, those who come and preach another gospel to you, they are angels. But later he says, they are uh, messengers of Satan. Now, what is again the word messenger? You check it out, it's the word angel. They are the angels of Satan. So angels of Satan, they preach another gospel. They still preach the gospel. It's called the gospel. It's called the name is the good news. It has to do with Jesus. It has to do with Christ. But the thing is, it's a perversion of that. Just as Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, he said that uh, the, if anyone comes to you and preaches to you, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, a gospel that we have not preached, uh, you may well put up with it. And he says that this, uh, what they bring is not actually the gospel, is the word of man. It's not by revelation of the Lord, it's the word of man. It's like they come and they say, now you have to keep this, now you have to keep that, or there is this kind of judgment coming, or there is that kind of, and they don't understand the whole purpose of the working of God is for redemption of mankind and not punishment, charge, accusation, condemnation, and death, not eternal torment and hell. They are the redemptive process of God and human soul that brings the truth of God into his mind so his thoughts can be free from the old thoughts and he can rise up and be who he is. Now that goes through some pain at times. Why? Because people reject it. It's like when I heard the gospel for the first time, it was a pain. Uh, not because God was bringing the pain to me, but because I was challenged uh, in my belief system. Uh, and I, I was uh, basically exposed to something that I couldn't resist, but at the same time, I didn't want to accept. So that's a place that is also gnashing of teeth, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth that Jesus talked about. I keep myself in that outer darkness and I don't respond to that calling that says, hey, come here, light is here. Come and enjoy, uh, come and sit on this um, table and eat uh, and be merry. Uh, the great supper of the lamb. All those things speak of basically revelatory uh, messages given by God to us so that uh, we can grasp that which is incomprehensible. Uh, it's just um, a knowledge, a wisdom, a truth, a judgment that is beyond human understanding. Uh, and, um, and that's just simply because man has chosen what is right and what is wrong. Uh, that's why even when, I mean, I think that's everybody's experience, when they hear the word of grace, they resist it in the first time. They say, so are you saying that um, so-and-so or that uh, politician or that murderer or that emperor or that, I don't know, whatever, world leader, Hitler, uh, are you saying that they are like me? I mean, I'm being a good person, they have killed. So you immediately see that their judgment is against based on good and bad and how much one has done uh, and how much the other one hasn't done, or good or evil that people have done. And that's their perception of who God is. And because of that, then we never understand the rest. But those who actually rely on the Spirit, and they, uh, like Paul, he says, they are willing to give up. They are willing to count everything that was a gain, a loss. They can come to get a new knowledge, they can come to understand uh, the mind of God. They can understand the heart of God. And they can understand the word of God. And they can understand not the letter of the word, but they can understand the truth of the word. And then when they speak, they literally become an angel of God. And they become the ones that gather together the elect that are being scattered. Now, 
I don't want ha time to explain this, but the four winds are basically, again, the, the work of God. The wind is the judgment of God, not, again, judgment in the sense of condemnation and killing and destroying. It's like how I was judged in the beginning in my thought process. And he came and he, like a, a great wind, a mighty wind, like you, you see, uh, it's even mentioned about Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost, like a mighty rushing wind. He came and blew over everything that I had planted in myself. He scattered all those things. Then, uh, if because of that, now he begins to plant other things, and then he causes the angels to come and basically gather together into his barn, or basically to have something that is now incorruptible and immortal. Uh, so the concept of angels actually is very extensive. Uh, if you want to study, you can. We might at some point, I don't know, maybe uh, have one uh, series for angels itself. But uh, for this uh, series, what Jesus meant series, we want to just quickly go through some of the things that Jesus said and explain them. We actually started uh, doing this three years ago in another series called School of Perfection. Uh, we began to explain words, terms, terminologies that are in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, because we knew that without understanding a word, uh, we can't convey a message. Uh, if, if you want to understand, uh, let's say if, if someone, if somebody like me who comes from another country to Canada, to a country whose language is English, if I come with my own vocabulary, I will never be able to have communion and fellowship with anyone that lives in this country. So I need to learn words and I need to learn what those words mean. Um, and then I can have that communication. So when we come to the Bible, when we hear things like the word grace, we have our own understanding and perception of graces, but now we have come to the spirit realm, to the kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, we need to understand what the word grace means. Um, because religion has taught us what grace is, newspaper tells us what grace is, parents have told us what grace is, but what really grace is? Uh, we have to understand this. That's why we started that school. Uh, we, we talked about grace, promise, covenant, ma many things like that. Uh, but then uh, basically we stopped at some point. Now in this series, what Jesus meant series, we're going through verses uh, things that Jesus said to cover them. So again, it's just because uh, unless we get out of the old understanding concerning these things, then we don't understand. Because today I didn't tell you how these angels work. Uh, what When he says they come, what do you mean? Like what kind of message they bring? How do they bring it? All those things. There are lots of things in the New Testament about angels and we can even glean great things from the Old Testament concerning those things. Uh, today I just wanted to show you that actually the concept of the angels in the Bible is not something separated from you yourself. It's not separated from the body of Christ, but it's actually in the context of human beings that are bringing the message of God to one another. Hope this helps. If you need uh, any help when it comes to reading and understanding of the Bible, uh, we actually have a uh, platform called PBB Membership, which uh, includes seven different courses, one of which is uh, a great uh, eight-week course on how to study the Bible and understand the mystery that is in the Bible through signs, symbols, and all those things. If you need any help, uh, just shoot us an email and we will definitely get back to you with some answers. Uh, thank you again. Until next week, uh, the grace of God, the word of truth, and the gospel of salvation uh, may change you every day again and again and again.